Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to our daily Dhamma broadcast. Today I thought I'd go back to the to the basics. Last night I was mentioned a little bit about the experience of being mindful, how it changes your perception of the experience, our ordinary, uh, ordinary perception of experience is uh, often clouded. It's wrong, to put it bluntly. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the experience of mindfulness, the very basics of our practice of mindfulness. And of course, to do that, we go back to the Satipatthana Sutta in the Diga Nikaya, number 22, and in the Majjhima Nikaya, Number 10. And so at the very beginning of this uh, sutta, of course, we have the Ekayano Ayang Bhikkhu Mago. We have the Buddha's expression of why he's teaching mindfulness purify beings and for the purification right of the mind for overcoming or, or overcoming mental illness sorrow lamentation despair for overcoming mental and physical suffering for finding the right path and for seeing nibbana but then he dives right into what it's like. What does it mean to be mindful? And he lays out the four satipatthana. So the four satipatthana, it's not important that you're able to categorize. The point is not to be able to recognize this is this satipatthana. Uh, now I'm practicing this one, now I'm practicing that one. It's more of a, um, a map, a, a laying out the framework by describing these four different aspects of experience or four different types of experience or ways of looking at experience he really fleshes out the the whole sphere of what it means to experience so you can look at experience physically there's the physical aspects the rising and falling of the stomach that's physical the lifting of the foot, the feeling of the tension in the leg, the feeling of the foot pressing against the floor, that's physical. Even just the feeling of sitting still, the tension in the back and the pressure against the floor. Heat and cold, that's all physical. That's kaya kaya nupasi viharati, one dwells, seeing the body as body or in the body one sees it as body in regards to the body one sees body and Vedana is the second one so if you focus on the feeling aspect of experience if you feel pain to be mindful of it as pain if you feel happy to, not to be mindful of that if you feel calm these are the three main feelings and uh, how you experience something, to experience it as pleasant, as painful, or as neutral. If you focus on the mental aspect of experience, jite jita nupasivi harati, thinking about the past or future, good thoughts, bad thoughts, doesn't matter what kind of thought, it's all thinking. 
And then Dhamma, which is a little bit unique, it, it deals with, it's much more, it's, a, it's different in quality than the others. Some of it deals very much with present experience, for example, the hindrances. It's very much a part of our experience, liking, disliking, drowsiness, distraction, doubt. There's much more in there. There's the senses, again, that's part of it, but then it gets on to the, there's the aggregates, there's the bojangas, there's the truths, noble truths. So it's much more about, uh, it's much more doctrinal. This is why I think it's called Dhamma. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. The essence of our practice is our experience, based on the four Satipatthana. But it's the quality that's in most interesting. Because quantity is fairly straightforward, right? You can tell me how many hours of meditation the meditators will often tell me how many hours of meditation they've done. I often tell the story of how I subbed in at a center that was quite adamant about the number of hours a meditator should do a day, so they would assign a number of hours. and. I have to say I don't find this to be incredibly helpful because it wasn't really working, at least for the foreign meditators who would spend all the time outside of their hours doing nothing. So I taught them how to be mindful from uh, from morning to night. I told them today you have to do 18 hours of meditation, which means I don't care how much formal meditation you do, do as much as you can comfortably. But outside of that time I want you to be mindful too. too have the quality of mindfulness. Hours are, are nothing, you can walk and sit for hours. In the end, it's both quality and quantity. On the other, Because on the other hand, as we'll see as I go through these, what we don't want is to become complacent. We don't want to think that I'm mindful and that's good enough. Mindfulness doesn't work that way. So we have three qualities what it means to be mindful, ata, pi, sampajano, satima. I'll go through these briefly. Ata, pi is a word that relates to temperature, heat. We use the word, um, or that, that's the where the etymology of it is. So it's used in a sense of, of exertion. In the commentaries, I think, refer to it as that which burns up the defilements. That's apt because we become we become complacent even in meditation. Like even if at some moment we're very mindful, this is how mindfulness becomes a hindrance because you're mindful, and then you cling to the fact that you're mindful. And meaning, you become uh, content. Oh yes, I'm very mindful now, and you're not anymore at that moment. Once you think about it and once you get attached to it, you're immediately no longer mindful. So adapi is the effort that we put out to build up quantity uh, and quality, it's both. When, which, both quality and quantity, which means you can't just practice for hours without having the mental energy to, to see the rising and the falling, put the mind with the object. When you walk, is your mind with the foot? Are you aware of the foot moving? Or are you letting your mind wander? And then quantity, are you doing it again the next moment? Are you moving from, are you, are you mindful of the next experience and the next experience? It takes an incredible amount of effort, an incredible amount of mental rectitude, so, you know, so uprightness of mind, straightness of mind. To, to keep yourself from sliding back into, oh, it's okay, I'll, let, I'll just take it easy for a bit, right? Something you have to train it, something that requires quantity to get good at. You have to do it again and again, and to really gain concentration, which is not mentioned here, but to get to the point where you're focused, which is what everyone understands is important in meditation. You have to practice, you have to cultivate it repeatedly, moment after moment. You can't lack, you can't slack off. Sampajano means to know something. 
but it's sampa. Sampa, these are prefixes to the word janya. Janya just means to know. Sampajano means to know something. But sampa mean they were they're like regarding wisdom really. But in the context, in the way they're used in the Satipatthana Sutta, it, it seems to refer to a good way of understanding of being aware or self-awareness. It's a word that's often used. Meaning the knowledge that we're looking for is not like the knowledge that I am a monk or that I am a man or that I am human or that I'm living in Hamilton. I mean, these are all knowledges, but they're not sampajanya. Things we know about the past or the future are also not sampajanya. Sampajanya is a really good word for reminding us of the present moment, reminding us that mindfulness has to be done now, has to refer to the present. What's happening now? If you are aware of what's happening now, meaning you see things, you see what is as it is. You're not lost in your head, judging it or reacting to it. You're clearly aware of the experience. That's sampajanya. It's a, no, a way of using the word knowledge, but it means awareness. Are you? Do you really know what's going on? Do you really know what's happening? Know in the sense of being aware of it. And finally, satima. Satima is really the key. It's what um, cements your awareness. It's what keeps you straight. It's what keeps your mind from floating away, from drifting away. It keeps your mind fixed on the object. Mindfulness is what, sati is what grasps the object. But it's grasps in the way we use this word in English, when you grasp a concept. Someone tells you something and, and they try to explain something and when you grasp, they ask, do you have a good grasp of what I explained to you? Well, we use the same thing to apply to experience. It, we all experience and we're aware of our experiences without mindfulness, without sati. Sati isn't just awareness. Those dogs are aware. If you have, you know, does a dog know whether it's walking? Yes, a dog knows that it's walking. We all know what's happening. If someone rings the doorbell, we all are aware of the sound. The awareness is there. It's not yet mindfulness. It's not yet satipatthana. Satipatthana is where you fix your sati, fix your, um, fix your mind on the object, remembering it. Sati really means remembering, or remembrance. The the Proximate cause of sati is something we call tira sanya. Sanya is a recognition of something. When 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 you see this as this, that is that. So when you know the doorbell is ringing and you hear the sound, there's a sanya. Ah, yes, that's a sound. You recognize it. Tira sanya is is where you. Tira means, means you, you, you augment or you reaffirm that perception. So it can, it can refer to a concept. Like if you say to yourself, Buddha, Buddha, thinking of the Buddha. Or if there's a doorbell and you think of yourself, doorbell, doorbell, doorbell. That's, that's, not my, that's mindfulness, but it's not, uh, it's not vipassana. So it, it's still mindfulness. It's not satipatthana in the way the Buddha is explaining it in this sutta. Although... Parts of this sutta are samatha, like the cemetery contemplations. The real core of it is vipassana, which means the object has to be experienced. So you can't say doorbell, doorbell. You have to say hearing, hearing, because that's the experience. But when you remind yourself hearing, you're augmenting, you're, you're strengthening that perception. You're fixing your mind and you're grasping that perception fully and completely. And that's what allows this change in perception. That's what allows us to see clearly where before we were confused or mistaken. The things that we thought brought us happiness when we apply mindfulness, and it's the only way we can break through the veil of ignorance. See things 
in a whole new way. It's quite, quite uh, eye-opening. So that's the what the Buddha says in the first section, and then he starts talking about the various. He goes through each of the four satipatthana in various ways, various ways by which one can practice sati. At the end of most of the sections, he says, I think all of the sections, he says, uh, for example, for the body, he says, one sees itiyajatangva kaye kayanupasi viharati. So one dwells in regards to the body, seeing it as body, seeing body. And then he, one sees the arising of body and the ceasing of body. One watches, meaning one is really aware of the experience from beginning to end. I mean, this is really what makes this an experiential practice. It's not about knowing, okay, now I'm walking. It's about really experiencing the beginning of a movement and the end of a movement. That's the samudaya dhamma nupasi or vaya dhamma nupasi. And then at the end he says something that I want, I'm really quite interested in. He says, Atikayoti va panasa satipachupatita hoti. One establishes mindfulness just to the extent, Atikayo, there is the body, or this is body. Meaning, meaning really it is what it is, is really the point. Not it is body, but that thing is what it is. Body is body, walking is walking. And so on. In the in the Sampajanya Baba, he says, "Kachantova kachami tibajanati." When when going, one knows I am going. I am walking. Kachami. So, Pali grammar is different from English, so one word means I am walking. In English, we just say walking, walking. But in Pali, you say "gachami," which also has the first person pronoun or first person subject embedded in it. And then, yava deva jnana mataya, patisati mataya, just for knowledge, just enough for knowledge and patisati, which means, I'm not quite sure, but I used to like this word, patisati means just mindfulness, just being mindful. This is the whole seeing things as they are, it's not adding anything. So instead of saying, this is good, this is bad, this is me, this is mine, we say, this is this. And if you're aware of that, that moment is mindfulness. You're aware of things as they are. Oh, I missed something from the last section. There's another important thing. Anyway, it fits with what I'm going to say next. But the Buddha says, Vineya loke abhijja domana sang. It's just important to mention. Um, by practicing sati, we are uh, overcoming, the idea is to overcome judgment, really, liking and disliking, because when you don't have, Ajahn Tong, he, he picks this apart, and so this this section, or that passage, it says uh, one puts aside liking and disliking, greed and anger, really, is what it's saying. And then he said, the question is, what about delusion? Because there are three bases for unwholesomeness in there, greed, anger, and delusion. Why isn't delusion here? And as I mentioned last night, this is, this is because of this concept of, of mindfulness being like a light. So greed and anger rely upon delusion. But delusion can't exist with mindfulness. So when you're mindful, delusion is gone. You might, you can still be mindful of greed and anger, you know, at least the, the the way they present themselves in your in your 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 experience. But at the moment when you're mindful, delusion is already gone. It's the opposite. Mindfulness is the opposite of delusion. And then he says, anisito javiharati. Related to this, anisito, one dwells. Um, independent. I remember earlier, a few few days ago, I was talking about the duality, and one of the dualities is how dependent dependency is vulnerability. The Buddha said, 
those who are dependent are vulnerable. Those who are independent are in, invincible, invulnerable. And you see this in various places, and, and it's a very good description of the power of, of mindfulness. That we have a, here a practice that makes you completely invincible, completely impervious to suffering, impervious to the the the, the trials and tribulations of samsara. Natyakinti lo geyo padiyati. One clings to nothing in this world. This is how you do it. You want to be free from suffering. If you want to be invincible, don't cling to anything. It's really, an, the Buddha said, this is the, the only thing you really need to know about Buddhism. If you want to practice, the only thing you really need to know before you start learning how to meditate, sabe dhamma na lang abhiniwesaya. No dhammas, nothing, no thing is worth clinging to. This is how one practices mindfulness. This is how one practices to be mindful of the four foundations of mindfulness. So it's quite simple. There's not a lot to it. And it's also quite uh, concrete, the difference between mindfulness and ordinary experience. Mindfulness is a deliberate, um, intentional, active, moment-by-moment -moment active activity. It's like, uh, it's like pounding away at metal. You know, Buddha used this simile of the analogy of uh, pounding like a blacksmith. When they heat it up and they pound it, every time you're mindful it's like you pick up the hammer and you hit the metal. Now you can't hit it once and then sit there and watch it and, and say, boy, what a good hit that was, or think that you, you, you did something. You have to keep every time. It has to be the same, every moment. Every time that you hit it, it becomes straighter. Mindfulness is this tool that we use to straighten our minds. So we apply it moment by moment. If you, obviously it's in the beginning, for sure it's going to be hit and miss, some moments mindful, some moments not mindful. But it's important, we be, it's very important we see the clear distinction there. You can only measure moments. You can't measure hours, days, months. We'll talk about how many years they've been meditating, it's not really that useful. What's useful to talk about is the moments. How, how good are you at being mindful, moment to moment? How many moments a day are you mindful? So, there you go, a little bit about mindfulness tonight. Again, basics, but the most important part of our teaching, really. So, thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all the best.